I invite you to turn with me to Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1, we read together from verse 13 to 22. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them when the Sabaeans raided them and took them away. Indeed, they have been killed and the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burnt up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, Another also came and said, The Chaldeans formed three, bond, three bands, raided the camels, and took them away. Yes, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And suddenly, a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house. And it fell on the young people, and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose tore his robe and shaved his head and he fell to the ground and worshipped and he said naked I came from my mother's womb and naked shall I return there the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away blessed be the name of the Lord in all this job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. Last week we started looking at this subject, responding to suffering, Job's case, and it was the first sermon as we considered a number of things, number of lessons. Just to remind us that we talked about suffering and we said to suffer is to sustain loss or damage, to endure pain or distress, to be subject to disability and all these were words coming to us to define suffering, but we also related them to Job's case and said, indeed, he sustained loss and damage. We knew that he endured pain and distress. We know that he was at one point almost subjected to disability. And we said there are a few lessons we can learn from the story of Job. Namely, suffering may come to even the godly. Job is described as one man that God singles out in this land and he says, have you considered my servant Job that he was a righteous man? So, you may be righteous, you may be a Christian, but it is no guarantee that you will not ever face suffering in your life. We also reminded ourselves that suffering may come unexpectedly. The sons and daughters were there and Job didn't even know it was going to happen. Suffering doesn't knock. 
we also noticed that suffering sometimes multiplies while we are dealing with one thing and our, another kind of suffering comes upon us. Beloved, it is important for us to reflect on what suffering is before we can respond to it. But we also reminded ourselves about the sufferer, that he goes through this unpleasant experience, that he is filled with pain, that is filled sometimes with hopelessness, that he is the one who feels the actual intensity of the suffering, that he has a troubled heart. We also said, since suffering is real, since suffering also came upon Job, we can learn lessons in terms of responding to it. And that's where we said, before we look at Job's response to suffering, we should look at other people as a way of bringing out this in order for us to appreciate that indeed this man was a sufferer by excellence, as they would actually call him. He responded well. Sometimes it is only when you look at the negative that you appreciate the positive. And so we said there are two examples of negative responses. Those who responded to suffering. And these people are not responding to their own suffering. They are responding to job suffering. One of them that we saw, we imported this thought not too far from where we are in chapter 1, verse 13 to 22, we moved on to chapter 2 and verse 9. We saw Job's wife, quick fix mentality, just curse God and die. We saw that she failed to see God's sovereignty. She failed to see God in the events that were happening around her husband around the family, she displayed an attitude. She displayed a heart that is very clear that it is not close to God at all. But apart from this particular woman, Job's wife, we also saw another in passing, just glancing over the reaction of most of his friends. These people, Job himself, describes them in chapter 16 as pitiless. They are without pity. They are not thinking about Job and his suffering. In other words, or putting it differently, they are not putting themselves in Job's shoes. So, this was all negative. But Job responded positively. Although he was not aware of the conversation in heaven, as we said, he still acknowledged God. He still responded in a godly manner. He did not accuse God, as we saw. This man prayed for relief. It is on that account that we have an example of positive responding to suffering that today would like to now streamline that or come down to just Job's response. How did he respond to suffering? Yes, we saw some responded in a way that is undesirable, a way that is not commendable, but for him, it was positive. Beloved brethren, everyone watching me tonight has either gone through difficult times or they are going through difficult times. There has never been a human being who has never undergone suffering. 
Life here, here below is not free from the burdens and cares. This shouldn't surprise us because the Bible tells us that life will be like this. In Job chapter 14 and verse 1, we see that he himself there is saying, this is the life of man. It is full of trouble. It is full of suffering. You cannot run away from it. It is reality. And I must say that since it is reality, we must equip ourselves in order for us to respond positively. God will be with us even through these trials, suffering, but he does not say he will wipe them away from us while we are here below. So Job is one man who goes through suffering here. And what we see in his response as we turn to God's word is that in verse 20, then Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. Before we examine and examine him closely how he responded, we see here in the first place that he shaved his head and tore his clothes. We reminded ourselves last week that this was an expression of grief. This, we see here, is a sign that he was mourning. When others are mourning, decide to wear a certain kind of clothes. And in those days, when you are mourning, it was very common to shave your head. And this particular action is not just to say that you are mourning, like we do national mourning. We have here songs that are religious, Christian music being played and people are somber. We are mourning and we have not gone to work because we are mourning. Here it has got a connotation of being devastated. So before we start thinking of his response, we must know that this is a sign to show that the man was devastated. And to be devastated, sometimes we may even think that we are shattered. Dreams of seeing his grandchildren from his children are shattered. And this man is devastated. He is in a place where he is low. That is what suffering does to us. This is what is happening. But how did he respond? Number one, he turned to God. He turned to God. Why are we saying that he turned to God? It's simply because we are told here that after this action of tear in his robe, and shaving his head in verse 20, he fell down to the ground and worshipped God. So the first response or the first thing that we see in his responding to suffering is that he turned to God. When there is a problem, for instance in a family or at home, and it is the wife who has remained or it is the children that have remained and the man of the house has gone to work. Perhaps there is a problem and maybe there has been a breaking or an attack or something or the child is sick. And who do you call? The man of the house. You turn to him because you are in trouble. We see Job turning to God. That's the first thing that he does. You and me experiencing the loss of our children, the loss of property, perhaps a day in an hour, will probably not turn to God. 
We will be looking for that perpetrator of this crime which has brought upon our, our families untold misery. And we will be looking for them. We'll spend time. Is it not the natural reaction of man? When you feel aggrieved, when you feel hurt, that you want to look for someone who is responsible for your misfortune, not with Job, he turned to God. In the state of being devastated, in this state of losing everything, he came to God. He turned to God. Many have turned against the Lord because of one particular instance, one particular problem. Sometimes things which even later on, when you think about, they were not worth responding in that matter, man, manner. Rather, this man turned to God. It has been said that Job lost everything during this time, and we must emphasize. Someone put it nicely using the letter F. It is true that he lost his family finances, fitness, and friends. Family, fitness, finances, friends. And these are the things that will constitute what makes you happy. He lost them, but he still turned to God. Notice with me in verse 11 of chapter 1 of Job, that when there is this conversation between the devil, between Satan and God, uh, there is something that Satan says in verse 11, but now stretch your hand and touch all that he has and he will surely curse you to your face. Not just here, in chapter 2 and verse 5, we see him repeating these things. He's so sure about it. He says, but stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh and he will surely curse you to your face, to your face. What we are seeing here is that it was... Satan's wish that Job would turn away from God. It was his ambition to make sure that Job turned against God. But we see that this man did not do that. His response was to come to the Lord. The very place to the very person, I may put it this way, where he was saying, if you take away these things, he will still come to you. Does this not remind us of how children behave? Especially young ones, those who have not really grown in their sin and rebellion. You will smack them. Those who live in areas where they do smack, or you discipline them. And when you do that, they will still come back to you. Say one word to a brother here at church or wherever at work. Just one, two, one sentence. And they will never talk to you for the rest of their life. They will never talk to you even when you are in trouble. They've held it against you. But we see here Job returning or turning to God even when he is devastated. Beloved friends. This is no easy action, no easy move, no easy exercise. Indeed, he turned to God amidst this devastating feeling and suffering. But while we examine this first response of turning to God, we probably would like to ask a few questions about turning to God. Well, we must just emphasize this. What does it mean when we say God, I mean Job turned to God. He turned to God. 
Before we look at what it means, we must talk about what it doesn't mean. When we say that now God, I mean Job came to God, turned to God, we are not saying that he was in the wilderness before. We are not saying that he was living a reckless life. We are not saying that he had no time of interaction, you know, with the, 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 the word of God. He had no time even to fellowship with God. This man did these things. We see God himself saying he was a righteous man. We see him sacrificing to God just in case his children had fallen into sin while celebrating so we see that it doesn't mean that he was backslidden and far from God when we say that he turned to God. It doesn't mean that he was in the world. But this is what it means. It means that he made a move beyond his mourning. Notice with me that he says, Then Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. There is this aspect of him shaving, he, this aspect of him mourning, but he moved beyond mourning to come to God. That is turning to God. When you are suffering and we say that you ought to turn to God in your response, as you respond to suffering, we are saying you must move from this morning. We are not saying that you should dwell on these things and focus on these things and feel pity upon yourself. We are saying we must be like Job. Yes, we love this burden within us, but we decide and intentionally so to come to God. He moved beyond mourning. And that's why we say that he turned to God. And mind you, you can move beyond mourning to something else. But he moved beyond mourning to come to God. Beloved friends, it is important for us to move beyond anguish and mourning. Too often we begin to worry about circumstances and things that we can never change. Things that we love we have no control over things we cannot simply change. To turn to God means to come to God for help, to come to him for relief. Turning to God, and when we say Job, turn to God means it is to cast himself upon the Lord, to bring himself, cast himself upon the Lord. Beloved friends, this action of falling to the ground here is not an act of hopelessness. It is not an act of being defeated. It is an act of coming to God, turning to God. But we must also ask, why did he turn to God? Why come to God when he's devastated? It's simply because he had one God. He only had one God. That's why he came to him. That's why he turned to him. Remember the story in John chapter 6 and verse 68. And there we see the Lord Jesus Christ challenging the disciples. Will you also go away? And we have Simon Peter coming in the affirmative and saying to the Lord Jesus Christ that they will not go anywhere. He says to quote him, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe that you are the Christ. In other words, there is no other place to go to, no other person to go to and this is why he turned to God is simply because he only had one God one master just like you would like to call that there's a problem at home you not start calling every person left right and center unless the person that you trust is not in is not is not reachable 
But this man turned to God because he only had one God. He did not just have one God. He turned to him because he knew that God was sovereign. And when we talk about God being sovereign, we remind ourselves of two things. That he does things as he pleases, but that he's also powerful. We've obviously heard of sovereign nations. Those nations where you can't touch them. They are sovereign. And here we are not talking about even a place of corruption in being sovereign. God is sovereign. He is powerful. He does as he pleases. And he came to him because he knew that God was sovereign. And is in his sovereignty, God is full of love. In his sovereignty, we see providence. And therefore, Job came to him. And this is why he says, The Lord gave. And the Lord has taken away. Beloved friends and brethren, he turned to God because he knew that he was inadequate in himself. We can produce nothing through self-effort with the exclusion of God. So we must come to him and this is why he turned to him. Man cannot bring himself out of sorrow. And that is why we pray for God's comfort upon those that are, are bereaved. And that's why we pray for comfort upon those who are suffering. Beloved friends, there are examples of people who turn to God during their suffering. And these we find in the Bible itself. We ought not to go very far. There is an example of the Lord Jesus Christ. He turned to God there on the cross. He turned to God in the garden of Gethsemane. He turned to God. And we see words that are so touching as he wishes that if it were possible, this cup would be taken away from him. He addressed God. And there we see even men like David. David from the Psalms that we read, we see him running back to, to the Lord. We see him saying, the Lord is my refuge. We see other people who have contributed even to Psalms sounding exactly as David. But we also have Paul himself returning or turning to God. Beloved friends, beloved brethren, this act of turning to God like Job, when you are devastated, when you don't know the reason why you are suffering, when it is too heavy upon your heart, is a characteristic of godly men, godly women. Godly men and women, in times of trouble, they turn to God. And therefore, if this has not been your practice, it is a source of concern and worry. Only those who know they are God, only those who trust him, will turn to him. I remember listening to one of the young preachers, young pastors here in Lusaka preaching, and he made a statement where he said, trials often reveal your character. And indeed, yes, they do reveal one's character. So turning to God in this way is a revelation of his spirituality. We must hurry on. Apart from him turning to God here, because he addresses him and he worships him, we must now emphasize that he responded by worshiping God. We can say he turned to God. Secondly, he worshiped God. Verse 21. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. 
the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. These are just words to support what we see in verse 20. Remember, verse 20, the last word is worshipped. And this is now crystal clear about his response. In the second place, he worshipped God. Now, if you want to make it very clear, he turned to God, he worshipped God. When Job opened his mouth, it was not to complain. It was not to whine. It was not to start accusing. When he spoke, it was to praise the Lord. Beloved, worship is the act of attributing reverent honor and homage to God. It means to bow down to God. And this is why I was saying that he is falling to the ground. It is not an act of hopelessness. It is an act of worship. Worship means acknowledging God's supremacy. It involves submission or submitting to God. And when one submits to God, indeed it shows that they are humbling themselves. They humble themselves and come before God. And this is what Job did. Job did not stand and start beating his chest and, and start jumping and saying, the one who did this will see and or maybe as he has turned to God, he, he starts now praying and saying those dangerous prayers uh, to say, may he not see tomorrow. And God, why have you done this? This man worships God. It wasn't, and I repeat the falling down, an act of reflex despair, but worship. Bow down. Humble himself. How many of us do respond like this when we undergo suffering, humbling ourselves before God in worship? Oh, I must say that it is not easy. It's not an easy thing. But here is an example that this man worships God. We must remind ourselves the time in which he is worshipping God. He worshipped God amidst very difficult circumstances, amidst loss of property, loss of family in this context before we come to health. So he was worshipping God when it was painful somewhere in his heart. He was worshipping God when it was not easy. Some of us do just understand worship. We construe worship as coming to church to sit, sing, and, and, and hear God's word. And to us going to church, it is an automatic thing, maybe because there are rules in our homes that we have to go. And so we just go. It is something that we don't even debate about. It is part of us. Maybe it's because we come to enjoy ourselves here to see our friends, which is not a bad thing, but not the primary reason for coming to worship God. Here we see a worship that is coming from a heart amidst difficult circumstances, amidst Things that you and I can easily use to turn away from God. He worshipped him amidst these difficult things. We are to learn from here that he responded in worship irrespective of his circumstances. Why did he worship this God? 
He acknowledged God in his suffering. The Lord will never leave us. It is, as no, it is not as, as though the Lord went to sleep. He knows he's still alive. And that is why later on in this book he says, I know my Redeemer lives. He acknowledged God in his suffering. That he is still present. The Lord is still there. And this is why he worshipped him. It is not as though because of this suffering the Lord disappears. His glory is not there. His character, everything is blurred. But this man was able to acknowledge him. And that's why he worshipped him. How easy it is for nominal Christians to turn away from God in worship. This man did not forget his God in suffering. He knew his God was still on the throne. He knew that God was just. Though I am in these seemingly unfortunate circumstances, this man knew that God was just. He understood God is sovereign. He is on the throne. He is in charge of everything. No shaft can hit. The Lord is there unless he actually permits it and we see that this man he worships him because he knows God is just in Romans chapter 9 verse 14 Paul asks this question as he's talking about this issue of election some are chosen others are not and he will have mercy on whom he desires to have mercy, on whom he pleases to so have mercy upon. And we see Paul the Apostle saying, can we call God unjust because these things are happening? By no means. And this man worshipped God because he knew God was just. He wasn't unjust. He worshipped his God. He responded in this manner because he understood God's nature does not change. And when reflecting upon God's nature, we know he is pure. He's a God of faithfulness and without injustice. A God who makes no mistake. A God who will not overlook what is important and then rush back to come and correct it. He is a perfect God. So this man responded to him in worship. Beloved friends, he responded this way because of the confidence that he had in his God. And this should teach us something as God's children. We must respond in this way. That we love him, we trust him. We must worship him irrespective of the circumstances. And remember even Job himself telling the wife, should we only accept what is good, what is positive from God? We must give thanks all the time. In everything, give thanks. Quickly. Yes, We've seen that he responded by, re by turning to God and secondly by worshipping God, that he worshipped God. In the third place we, th we see that he remained faithful to God. Verse 22. In all this job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. Beloved brethren, beloved friends, Amidst devastating circumstances, he remained faithful. So there we see a picture. Turning to God. When you turn, it matters what you do. You worship him. You still give him the reverence. You still acknowledge he's on the throne. And you don't run away. Thirdly, Remaining faithful to God. He did not sin nor charge God. His friends accused him and called into question his faith in God. 
After the loss of everything he held, he still proclaimed. Like we see in Job chapter 13, and it is good for us to borrow these things and for us to see that this man, we are not just talking about what we see here. Job 13 and verse 15. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Even so, I will defend my own ways before him. What we are interested in is, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Friends, he is resolved, not just in chapter 1 and in chapter 2, even as the conversation goes on in the days to come, he still says he will trust him, meaning he will remain faithful to God. He was declaring his complete trust in God. I will stick, still stick to God. I will stick to him. I will stick with him. He was faithful. When we talk about the word faith, Borrowing from the Latin, we know that there is this connotation of confidence or trust in a person. Faithful. He continued in his confidence in God. He continued in his trust in God. In the context of religion, the context of our Christianity, being faithful or having faith means belief in God, belief in him. And this man remained faithful, believing, trusting, having confidence in God. How easy it is for a man who is not close to God, a man who does not walk with the Lord, to have their confidence in the Lord eroded by problems. How easy it is for a man who is shaking their Christian life, a man who is not grounded in the things of God, to be shaken. This trust, confidence in God eroded as it were. And maybe we are using the word eroded, which may seem to us like everything is swept away and we know that it cannot be swept away completely but there comes a time when some of the people may show and display acts of sinfulness attitudes of sinfulness attitudes of selfishness only thinking about their heart and their ego and the, 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 their problems as it were this man remained faithful to God. To remain faithful, in other words, we are saying, it is not to turn against the Lord, to hold on to your faith in the Lord. As we see him responding in Job 13, though he slay me, though he permits this miserable suffering, if I may speak, may call it that way, I will still follow him. I'd like to challenge you, beloved friend, beloved brethren. Have we been faithful to the Lord amidst suffering? Have we responded with faithfulness to him? When we do not respond with faithfulness, we are simply saying all along, we have just been committed to him because of the benefits that we derive from him. That would be true of you. As the devil here was saying, Satan was saying, he worships you because of what you have. That could be our testimony. We don't worship him genuinely. But this man, we see that he's faithful, genuine. To be faithful, here we are saying that he maintained confidence. And that is very important. Maintaining confidence in the Lord. That is remaining faithful. Not having moments of doubt. 
moments when you respect them less, moments when you do not respect God and give him even the worship that is due, it is constant. If anything, this is when some are drawn closer to him. Beloved, he remained faithful because he never lost his faith. His relationship was never lost. Trust is the only option that we have amidst trials, amidst conflict, amidst affliction. Trusting in him, maintaining the confidence, maintaining the trust. Beloved friends, this kind of faithfulness we see here where he does not sin, meaning he does not do or think something that is contrary to God's commands. He thinks no evil of God. He does not engage himself in evil vices. This can only be described as a faithful response, but we can also say that it is some an unconditional faithfulness. Some of us are faithful to our bosses because there is a condition attached to it. Some of us may be faithful in our marriages because of certain conditions, but this was an unconditional faithfulness. Not because of what you are scared of losing, not because of favors. He loved God. Unconditional faithfulness. How faithful are we, beloved friends? We have people in the Bible again to give us some examples of people. Uh, that is an example of people in the scriptures who are faithful. They remained faithful. The Lord Jesus Christ, obedient even to death. Faithful, maintaining faithfulness. He was faithful to his father, faithful to the cause. Suppose the Lord was like some of us. I know it's a weird example. Who so easily gave up? Who so easily cut that faithfulness to God, where would we be? We see Stephen, faithful to the Lord, stoned to death. There are many others. Why did he remain faithful? Because he knew God was the only hope. Because he knew there was no other God he remained faithful as we saw in John chapter 6. And there we see verse 68, to whom shall we go? He's the only God. He remained faithful because he knew his duty in affliction. Our duty in affliction is to remain faithful to God, to cling to him not to depart, but to cling. And clinging means going nowhere. He remained faithful because he knew God will never fail his children. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. We sing that hymn so many times. And it is a declaration that only God and him alone do we have. We also see the writer to the Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Away from the Old Testament in the New Testament, God 
will never forsake you. And so he remains faithful because he knows he will not be disappointed. Beloved friends, how have we responded to suffering? How many times have we seen affliction bringing out the evil in us? How many times have we seen people failing to pray because they have lost their loved ones? How many times do we ourselves get so disappointed about the loss of job and loss of opportunity, failed relationships, failed marriages that ruin our lives and we stay away from the Lord. Suffering is meant to build our character. Beloved friends, as we see even the writings in the New Testament, even Paul himself saying we must count it all joy. Is it James? That we must count it all joy when we go through trials. Of course, even Paul writes about perseverance coming, producing character. What about the overall knowledge that God is still with us? What about God's word telling us that we are to comfort those who are suffering, those who are mourning with the comfort with which we have received? And so there is a purpose and we must respond positively to suffering. True suffering, not just because you have been dumped, because your friend has been promoted and you have remained and you still have a blessing ahead of you, a blessing in front of you rather. We are talking about suffering in real terms. Of course, not to, down, not to downplay the, the, the dev devastating feeling when we are at that point when we lose something, but we must consider job suffering, that it is the most intense suffering that you ever can think about, apart from Christ on the cross. Therefore, we must conclude, beloved brethren, without saying so many things, that how we respond to suffering really matters. We miss the first step of turning to God. We will find ourselves sinning all over, saying things all over. And by the time we try to correct things, we had no time to place this particular trial into God's perspective. We must be like Job in responding to our suffering. Before we open our mouth, and this is a lesson that we all have to learn, when we are bereaved, we must go to God. We must express ourselves before God. We must make sure that we turn to him. We must make sure that we worship him. We should not turn to him and accuse him, but worship him. And trust him that he is wise. And trust that all things work together for good to those that love the Lord. Those who are called according to his purpose. Those who are loved by God, this perfect God who is full of love. A God who can never wish evil upon us. A God who will not distract us. A God who will say, I know your plan. I know, I know your life. And I've got plans to prosper you. There must be a devotion on our part in suffering. There must be dependence upon God. The hymn writer says, He leadeth me. And in that hymn, we will close reflecting on those words that indeed the Lord leadeth his children.